So for module four, genre, we're going to now talk about domestic drama. Domestic drama, again, its roots are in the late 19th century, a very, very popular art form in the 20th century and on into the 21st, still going strong on TV today. Behold the cast of This Is Us. Okay, so again, let's unpack um, the kind of elements of domestic drama, characters, language, plot direction, plot resolution, and we will also talk about what's not listed here, which is the emotional impact on the audience. Okay. So here's a still from the Broadway uh, revival production of A Raisin in the Sun, starring Denzel Washington. Um, and this is a perfect play to kind of talk about domestic drama with. Maybe you've read it in high school. If not, you should check it out because it's definitely an American classic. Um, but with domestic drama, the focus is on, quote, normal, everyday, regular people. So not extraordinary people like in a tragedy, not kind of two-dimensional stereotypes like in a comedy or a melodrama. These people are well-rounded and complex human beings with psyches that, that you know, are based in our understanding of the human psyche today. Um, but they are definitely kind of regular, kind of quintessential, could be any one of us people, not one percenters and not, you know, super extraordinary, amazingly unusual people. And with a domestic drama, the protagonist might be one character or a group of characters. And because domestic, right, that term means of the home and of family life, um, domestic dramas are often centered on a family. Or a domestic drama could be centered on a group of characters who act like family for each other, like the characters in Grey's Anatomy. As those seasons go on, there are, what, like 15 seasons of this show now, right? The, comp the relationships get complicated because people keep getting married and divorced and falling in love and all that other stuff, right? But essentially, these are co-workers who are close like family. Again, so here I am summing up my lecture for you in the list. Moving on to language, I don't have a pretty picture to put in here, um, but it is prose. It's everyday language, and it's kind of, in many ways, the most down-to-earth language of all of the genres. We're not really dealing in poetry here. We're dealing with the kind of gritty, real, everyday. All right, let's talk about plot direction. Here is a photo image from a stage production of August Osage County, which has also been made into a movie, which maybe some of you watched for your acting uh, journal prompt a few weeks ago. So when we're dealing with a domestic drama, right, obviously it's going to be dealing with problems concerning a family or a home. Now you say, but Julie, Antigone was about a family because Creon was Antigone's uncle and it's having to deal with her brothers and her sister and blah, blah, blah. And yeah, 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 right. You know, it, they were a family, but it was not a normal family, right? So domestic drama is about stuff that could happen to your family, much more so than the stuff that's happening to Antigone is likely to happen to your family, okay? So we're dealing with serious situations, you know, divorce, illness, addiction, coming of age, getting old, <laughs> moving, losing a job, getting divorced, coming out as gay, whatever, right? Serious situations that could be encountered in our everyday lives, but doesn't quite reach the heights of a tragedy or the kind of exaggerated craziness of a melodrama. And like a tragedy with a domestic drama, audiences do not have a sense that everything's gonna turn out okay doesn't quite reach that same level of like, oh yeah, everything's going to be doomed like we have in a tragedy, but we definitely don't have that kind of complacency with a comedy or even a melodrama that things are gonna turn out okay. It's squishier, and so we're kind of left with a little bit of unease, which is not unlike regular real life. On to plot resolution. Here is a still from uh, the film last year, A Marriage Story. 
So with a domestic drama, by the time we reach the end, we have a climax, the conflict that MDQ gets answered, the conflict gets resolved, but we don't have a sacrifice of the protagonist. We don't have the suspension of natural laws and we don't have poetic justice. Instead, we have life. Characters may come out more or less okay. Endings may be more or less happy, but they're going to be kind of complicated and messy, just like our lives are. So the emotional impact of a domestic drama is that it's really kind of exploring and honoring the problems that you know, we all face in life, which is really not much of an escape, right? If that's what we're going to the theater for is some sort of escapism or to wrestle with big issues or to cut our fears down to size or to feel good that there is, you know, a moral arc to the universe. Domestic drama doesn't really give us any of those. So why go see them? Well, Henrik Ibsen, who wrote um, many plays that scholars consider either domestic dramas or sometimes tragedies or sometimes in the middle. Um, but he called them problem plays because what he said was, I am interested in exploring a current problem in our society. And so to wrestle with that problem, I'm going to write this play and have the characters kind of work it out. And so audiences will see this play. They will recognize the character struggles as struggles that could be going on in their own lives. And then they will work out answers to solving this social problem. And so Ibsen was writing in the 1870s through the 1890s, and his first big play of this type was called A Doll's House. That was a play about uh, a young married couple, and she had forged her husband's name on a loan in order to save their family from financial ruin, which sounds like a noble thing. She was, she was being altruistic, not trying to embezzle or steal money or anything, but trying to save the family, save their house. Um, but she was living in a time where women could not conduct business on their own, so she couldn't take out a loan herself. And so to sign her husband's name um, was not only illegal, but also considered like unfeminine and unnatural and um, you know just a terrible, awful, who could have even think of this thing to do? So Ibsen wrote this play with this very sympathetic character and you see her whole story and you understand that she's a good person and that you realize, you know, halfway through the play that she's done this, quote, terrible thing. But audiences have invested in her. And so maybe audiences will start to think about like, hmm, maybe we should rethink these kind of weird prohibitions against, you know, women being able to have any financial power of their own. And Ibsen said, once we've addressed this social problem and it's solved, then people won't be as interested in my plays anymore and they won't come out and see them and it will go away. I'm not sure that that has come to pass because A Doll's House is still a very, very popular um, play that gets performed over and over and over again um, around the world and in this country, even though the specific social problems that Ibsen wanted addressed have by and large been resolved. So, Domestic drama, even though it's not an escape, um, it can be a way for us to think about issues and problems and things that are going on in our lives and our society and looking at them, you know, realistically as opposed to in the kind of exaggerated funhouse mirror way in a comedy is another way to call us to action. And of course, with domestic drama, our empathy is much more engaged than it is in a comedy. And so it's, it's a more emotional approach to these kind of same societal problems. Um, and so we're also kind of celebrating that sense of human dignity um, when faced with the travails of being a human in the world today. Very briefly, I just wanted to go over, these are not the only genres of theater. Um, Movies and films, right, they have lots of different genres like, you know, action, adventure, romance, uh, horror, fantasy, blah, blah, sci-fi. I'm not going to put those in here with theater because I think it just kind of muddies the water, right? Um, but we do have a few others. 
something that was popular um, kind of post-Shakespeare and through the 19th century, and I guess maybe even into today, right? Sometimes they're called tragicomedies. Um, and that just means, like, eh, we kind of mishmashed both kind of elements of tragedy and comedy together and gave you something kind of in the middle, which is fine. Um, but I'm not sure how much of those will really stand the test of time. You know, tragedies like Antigone are, what, 2,400 years old, 2,500 years old, and they still kind of resonate with us. Comedies... Um, even if the jokes get a little stale, um, kind of laughing at the human condition, that can withstand the test of time as well. But tragic comedy it kind of feels like Diet Coke to me. It doesn't really, it doesn't really commit, and so therefore I don't know how well it's going to last. And then we have other genres too that just kind of defy traditional emotional experiences and structure. Um, so we have performance art or experimental theater, and those... Um, forms are really a lot more interested in provoking a direct response from the audience by engaging with them directly so that the audience can kind of become participatory in the action. So um, instead of being a fly on the wall, kind of watching what's happening as if, as if we are spying on the characters and they have no idea what they're there, um, experimental theater will address the audience directly, talk to us, recognize that we're there, and, and oftentimes ask for us to, you know, shout out a suggestion or get up on stage and participate or um, otherwise impact the stuff that's going on. I think that's probably enough we need to say about that there. If you leave with nothing else from this class but the four genres of tragedy, comedy, melodrama, and domestic drama, we'll have done our jobs.